It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Blaine Welk from Western University, London, Ontario. Dr. Welk is going to talk about quality of life measures in spinal cord injury. He's uniquely qualified to discuss this as he's developed a patient-reported outcome measure called the Neurogenic Bladder Symptom Score. This is a very powerful instrument to measure patients' quality of life with neurogenic bladder and spinal cord injury bladder management. And it's one of the questionnaires that we'll be using in our PCORI grant, Bladder Management Strategies in Spinal Cord Injury. Quality of Life in Spinal Cord Injury. My name is Blaine Welk, and I'm an Assistant Professor of Surgery and Epidemiology and Biostatistics at Western University, and I work as a urologist at St. Joseph's Hospital in London, Ontario. There are several characteristics which we measure in our day to day life or in clinical practice. There are things such as blood pressure, temperature, and distance, which we all can conceptualize easily and have no issues understanding how measurement applies to them. However, when we move to non-absorbable characteristics, such as pain, disability, work limitations, health, or life satisfaction, measuring these qualities can be more challenging. An easy way to think about this concept is to think of quality of life measures for example as a ruler and the questions the patient answers are what determines where on the ruler they will score. This makes determining quality of life in an objective manner challenging. The way we usually like to conceptualize quality of life is that biologic and physiologic variables lead to symptoms. These symptoms affect someone's functional status the functional status leads to general health perceptions in that person, and the general health perception determines the quality of life. Unfortunately, it's usually not that simple, and there are external factors that influence steps along the way. As you can see, individual characteristics such as coping and resilience can influence symptom status, functional status, and health perceptions. The patient's individual values and preferences influence quality of life. And the environment a person is in also influences all of these different steps along the way to determining quality of life. So why do we need to measure quality of life? There are a couple different reasons. Firstly, objectivity. Using a standardized approach allows us to determine an objective measure of quality of life without impacting the decision with our own biases. Quantification allows us to analyze results and perform statistics which are not possible with non-numerical labels. It allows us to facilitate communication so rather than saying someone's in excellent health we can actually describe with a number or a score exactly what level of impairment or health may be present. Examples of this are the APGAR score or the trauma severity index in which saying the score to a person who understands these systems rapidly and efficiently communicates details about a patient. Economy, so again this may be a way to apply and interpret a patient's clinical situation very rapidly. And finally scientific generalizability. This allows us to come up with a common metric across individuals, investigators, and countries to be able to measure things in the same way, even in different situations. Many conditions have health-related quality of life. As you can see on this timeline, in the 1940s, measures were developed for cancer. And going forward through time, various different health conditions have had their own health-related quality of life scales developed, which have specific items and specific questions related to conditions. Ideally measures you are considering try to act as a ruler does for measuring length. The measurement tool should have very clear equal steps along the way, very clear rules for application, and unfortunately there are very few gold standards to apply things to. We need to consider several points in assessing quality of life. Firstly, point of view. There are several points of view that can be used to assess quality of life, including the patient, the caregiver, the physician, and the general public. Patients' views can change independent of external or objective changes. We want to know what we want to measure. General quality of life asks very general questions which may not be impacted by 
small changes to specific conditions. For example, questions for general quality of life measures include things like, in general, would you say your health is, or do you feel downhearted and blue? However, this should be contrasted with specific health-related quality of life, where questions are put in context of a specific problem. For example, in general, do bladder problems complicate your life? And then finally, you want to understand why you are measuring something. There are three general reasons why you want to measure quality of life. One is to demonstrate a change over time. Number two is to be able to classify people at one point in time. And the third reason is to predict something about the future. This example goes over spinal cord injury quality of life over time. As you can see, there are different patterns for patients with spinal cord injury over the five years after their injury. If you look at the first frame here, you can see at the time of injury, this group of patients did not have a significant change in their quality of life and maintained a high quality of life throughout the five years after their injury. Other patients respond differently to the same injury. You can see in the second frame here, these patients all had significant decreases in their quality of life after their spinal cord injury, but over time they were able to improve their opinion of their quality of life despite no objective improvements in their functional status. Finally, there are groups that do not necessarily compensate for the change in their quality of life induced by spinal cord injury. In the fourth panel here you can see this group of patients never actually regain their full quality of life that they felt they had before the injury. So there are many models out there that assess general quality of life. Probably the most famous one is the F SF36 which separates out eight domains into two main components, a physical component and a mental component. The physical component contains questions around physical functioning, their role, body pain, and general health. The mental component contains issues around mental health, emotional roles, social function, and general vitality. When you want to use a measurement to be able to differentiate people from other people with a similar condition, you need to look carefully at the quality of life measure and determine how well it will separate out your population. If we look at this first box here, you can see there's a continuum of physical activity that people could report. On one extreme, you may have a very healthy person that's able to perform vigorous activities. At the other end of the spectrum, you may have someone with severe physical impairment who's basically confined to a bed because of illness. If most of your population of patients is in the bottom end of this scale, you want to be able to use a scale that's going to separate out these patients. In other words, the tick marks on the ruler must include ticks around more severe impairment. Compared to a patient who is very physically active, even small changes in their ability to do vigorous activities may be impactful to them, but if you're only measuring very large changes, you won't detect this. Another way of looking at this is to go back to our analogy of the rulers. In an ideal situation, your ruler would cover the full spectrum of disease or quality of life that you're wanting to measure, and there would be equal tick marks between each of the functional levels of impairment. Problems occur if you have a very coarse ruler, so in other words, something that only differentiates between large jumps in the scale. So for example, if your ruler went from are you able to perform vigorous activities to are you only able to walk slowly, and there were no categories in between, it would be very difficult to detect small changes in someone who's normally able to do very vigorous activities. Rulers can also have floor problems and ceiling problems. Again, conceptually this means that your ruler is very good at measuring the bottom end of the spectrum or the top end of the spectrum. So in order to evaluate your purpose and the measurement tool's purpose to see if they should align, you need to consider three things. Firstly, what is being measured or the concept in whom is it being measured or the population and why is it being measured so what is the purpose of your measurement let's apply this to some examples around neurogenic bladder the qualivine was developed almost 15 years ago in the original article published in european urology in 2001 this quality of life measure was designed as a urinary specific quality of life measure for neurogenic bladder 
It was originally developed in France, and it was validated mainly with male spinal cord injured patients. It includes 30 items that are spread across four domains, including limitations, constraints, fears, and feelings. It was designed to be cross-sectional and responsive. In this table, you can see the different questions that comprise each of the four domains. As you can see, they all relate directly to a urinary or bladder problem. The neurogenic bladder symptom score is meant to be a symptom score specifically for neurogenic bladder patients. It was developed using input from patients with spinal cord injury, MS, and spina bifida. It has a total of 22 questions that span three domains, incontinence, storage and voiding, and consequences. It was originally designed as a cross-sectional tool and further works underway to assess its responsiveness. The important distinction between the neurogenic bladder symptom score and quality of life measures such as the qualivine is a symptom score does not place any judgment on the level of symptoms. In other words, objective questions are asked about the degree of leakage. For a quality of life measure or a bladder specific quality of life measure, questions would be directed at a patient's feeling about the level of incontinence or about a patient's impact on their life resulting from urinary incontinence. Here you can see the questions and domains assessed for with the neurogenic bladder symptom score. There are other neurogenic bladder tools that have been developed, including the ABSST, which was developed for multiple sclerosis patients and used as a screening tool to predict the need for urologic assessment. The incontinence quality of life tool was originally developed for men and women with incontinence and overactive bladder. It was subsequently validated in a neurogenic bladder population using a Botox randomized controlled trial. However, this illustrates some of the challenges when validating a tool in a new population. When we look at some of the questions that are part of the IQOL, they include things such as, I have to be careful when standing up from sitting. Obviously, this question would be considered insensitive and inappropriate for a spinal cord injured patient. Other questions such as, I worry about where toilets are in new places, can be interpreted differently. For the overactive bladder population, this question was meant to be interpreted as, I have urinary urgency, so I worry about where the washrooms are so I can get there quickly. For the spinal cord injured population, this may be interpreted as, I worry about where the toilets are because not all of them will be wheelchair accessible and I need to know where wheelchair accessible toilets are. There are many general quality of life tools for spinal cord injured patients. One such as the life satisfaction questionnaire, quality of well-being, satisfaction with life, SF36, quality of life profile for adults with physical disabilities have all been studied or used in patients with spinal cord injury. However, going back to the previous point, it's important to look at the actual questions and see if they do really apply to spinal cord injured patients appropriately or if they need modification. Ideally, all of these quality of life tools, if they were going to be used in a spinal cord injured population, would be specifically validated in a spinal cord injury population. What that means is a formal study would be done to prove that the measurement characteristics such as reliability and validity of these tools are appropriate in spinal cord injured patients. This graph shows differences between spinal cord injured patients and non-spinal cord injured patients across four different countries. This shows the variability in the effect on the different domains of the SF36 depending on whether the patient has a spinal cord injury or not. Obviously Domains such as physical functioning and role limitations that are physical have a significant impact and generally people with spinal cord injury have a lower score than people without a spinal cord injury. Intuitively, this makes sense. It's important also to notice that depending on the country, different results may be seen. This relates to some external factors. If we think back to the original diagram of determinants of quality of life, things such as the physical environment and other people's perception of spinal cord injury would have a big impact on these domains. A newer spinal cord injury quality of life measure was developed by Dr. Tulski. It uses a calibrated item bank to assess domains within subgroups. 
computer adaptive testing is used to try to minimize the respondent burden and decrease the number of questions that are required to be answered in order to generate a accurate quality of life. Many different modules are available. For example, these are some of the questions that are part of the bladder management difficulties module. Finally, it's important to note that urologic issues and general health and quality of life are important domains for people with spinal cord injury. A rapid review published in Spinal Cord Injury this year summarized the priorities among spinal cord injured patients. As you can see, areas of bowel and bladder function are a high priority and they were considered to be significant areas in terms of impact on quality of life. In conclusion, there are currently no large-scale longitudinal bladder related quality of life studies among spinal cord injured patients. It's important to read the original measurement article to help you decide if that tool will be useful for your purpose. Not all quality of life measures are created equal and there is still room for significant work in the field of quality of life and spinal cord injury. Thank you. specific health